Good morning and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange. Scientists in every Florida school and the Anjari Foundation are so excited to have you joining us here today. Uh, we've had an exciting semester of live webinar events like with Ocean uh, scientists like today and we're here again in this monthly series to dive in to all things marine science and explore what's happening in the field. Um, the interesting careers that are in the field and more. So today we will be speaking with Dr. Valeria Pizarro of the Perry Institute for Marine Science, who will be talking to us about stony coral tissue disease. And first, we'd like to tell you a little bit more about our programs. The Scientist in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The mission of CEFs is to engage Florida K-12 students and teachers in cutting edge research by providing science, uh, role models like today, and experiences to hopefully inspire future stewards of our planet. The Anjari Foundation, our partner, is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida, and the foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education. Many of the foundation's primary initiatives also involve their 65-foot research vessel, the RV Anjari. In case you missed any of the information in today's preview slides, we'd like to remind you that you can submit questions to our scientists by typing them in the chat box. We'll also provide a survey at the end of today's presentation for a chance to win some really great swag, so be sure to take part in that as well. At this time, we'd like to introduce to you Valeria Pizarro, who again is going to share more about herself, her work and its importance. Dr. Pizarro, we're going to go ahead and turn things over to you at this time. I'll stop share. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so yeah, my name is Valeria Pizarro. That, uh, can you see my screen? We sure can, y'all. Yep, we sure can. Okay, perfect. So again, thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here as, um, yeah, we are going to talk today about the stony coral tissue loss disease. But before we do that, I'm just gonna talk a little, oh, I cannot do this. Okay, yes, a little about me. So I'm originally from Colombia, that is the red country that you can see in the corner of South America. And I've been always being passionate about passionate about animals, and I'm gonna blame my mother for this. So this photo is well, when I was about two to three years old, and we did this photo um, photo shoot with a lot of animals. And since then, I've been just studying animals. And I went to school to a place where we used to go hiking to different places around Colombia, and it was a great. Uh, time for me. And from there, I think with the combination of both of both of those things, I became a bio biologist. And I started actually working with monkeys, with howler monkeys, as you can see there. And then I started studying bears, the only South American bear that is a spectacular bear. But when I was transitioning from graduating from my undergrad to the, my graduate schools, I took a diving course. And since then, actually, I became a sea lover. And then I learned about corals. And then I learned about coral reefs. And I've been studying corals and coral reefs for more than 20 years. And since 2019, I've been working with the Perry Institute for Marine Science. Since 2020, I became the coral manager, the coral program manager, and I've been living in the Bahamas since 2019. So our organization, what we do at the Perry Institute for Marine Science, aka PIMS, is we work on projects that are science-based to have enough information that we can share with the government and with the community for better ways to conserve and manage environment, thinking always on marine environments. We do have different programs. We have the one that I manage, that is coral reefs, fisheries, coastal habitats, and communities. But of course, what I do is coral reefs, and we have different projects within the programs. One is mainly uh, focused on understand how are coral reefs in the Bahamas and the Caribbean, 
what that means in terms of the community, what that means in terms of climate change. So we do a lot of coral reef assessments. One, some of them we have done it with, with the Anjari Foundation on the Anjari vessel, which is great. We do have a big program on coral restoration that is based on, a, it's called Reef Rescue Network that we work with dive operators to have like nurseries all around the Bahamas and in some other places in the Caribbean. And now with this coral, with this coral disease that I'm gonna talk to you today, I've been dedicating most of my time on studying and understanding stony coral tissue loss disease. But why are we studying this disease and why do we care about coral reefs and corals? So coral reefs are actually the ecosystem, marine ecosystem with the highest biodiversity. It is called the um, tropical rainforest of the sea. And it provides a lot of what we know as ecosystem services to the community. That means us. One is like just the beautiful places that we visit in the Bahamas, the Caribbean, that have these really blue, clear waters, that it's one of the benefits that we get from, from coral reefs. But we do get a lot of chemical products that are used in medicine to create new drugs, like related some with cancer and others. So we do have a lot of services that we benefit from coral reefs, and that is the importance of corals and coral reefs. So that's why it's very important for us to preserve, conserve, manage, and restore these ecosystems. And I'm gonna talk to you today about the stony coral tissue loss disease, and in English, and I might be mis not pronouncing it the way, we call it as well, um, squiddle D. So it's just because of the acronym, the name that, that, that we have named, stony coral tissue loss disease, is not the best, um, but it is what we have now. This disease is actually uh, one of the many diseases that we have in the Caribbean. And actually the Caribbean is known as the disease hotspot. And what that means is just that the Caribbean is a place where we have a lot of coral diseases. So in all the coral reefs around the world, in the Caribbean, we can find more than 22 coral diseases. Those have been killing corals for many years. And this is something that worries us, but the stony coral tissue loss disease is the most recent disease. And actually it's even more um, like, the, like the danger of this disease is higher than any other disease that we had had in the Caribbean. And why are we saying this? Well, this disease has been, was discovered first or observed first uh, off the coast of Miami in 2014. It has been spreading since then to more than 28 countries around the Caribbean. It led just in the Florida Reef Track, that is a really large area. It went from 2014 to 2021. It covered every single reef of the Florida Reef Track. And it is what we call the greatest immediate sorry, threat to Caribbean coral reefs. So this, um, this disease is affecting more of half of the corals that we have right now in Caribbean coral reefs, and this is very worrisome. So this is to show you, this is called uh, the, the this, this is from the from Agra website that is one of the monitoring sites that we have for the disease. And what is this dashboard, what is showing us is where the disease is present at the moment, how many countries have been treating corals. And I will explain to you a little more um, um, like in the following slides, how many countries are engaged in coral rescue. And I will explain to you as well that. But one of the things that I want to talk to you is this number over here, the 34. So in the Caribbean, we have about 45 uh, coral species that are involved in the process of building up coral reefs. So when we have 45 coral species that are building and are the ones that maintain coral reefs, and we have this disease that is affecting 34 coral species, that means that most of the coral species can get this disease. 
And maybe I didn't explain this, but when we have coral diseases, these diseases actually what it do it does is uh, these diseases kill the coral. So when we talk about coral diseases, it's different than when we talk about human diseases. We can get sick, but then we can take some medicine and then we feel fine and we get healthy. With corals, in many cases, they get the disease and they, even if we give them some medicine, as I will show you in a minute, they won't be able to really cure and be healthy again. But they will have some, what we call partial mortality, and many of these corals will die eventually. So what do we know about this disease? We know still very little. We are, we haven't identified the pathogen, that means the microbe or bacteria or virus that is causing this disease. We do know from recent studies that it's more likely that bacteria are involved in the process. We do know that there might be a virus uh, involved in the process of developing the disease, but the truth is that we haven't identified who is the, the bacteria or the microbe responsible for this disease. That limits our capacities to treat corals and to save coral reefs. We do know that they can be spread from country to country, like from Florida to the Bahamas. The more likely source of this disease transportation is being on shipping. Um, boats. So we have several studies now that are showing like how like these boats, what they do is they collect water to so they can be stable. So when they go from one country to the other, when they are arriving to the to the dock to the other country to the port, they will just release that water. They should be releasing that water very far from the from the port, but sometimes they just wait until they're closer. And this has been the, the way that they have been dispersing this disease between countries. We know that in the local scale, when you're talking about around an island, the disease is actually going by, it can be transmitted by boat. We humans, we can take it by divers as well, or even just some fish will eat the disease coral and go to a healthy coral and, and buy that healthy coral, and that will be something that will disperse the disease. So I want you to show you this. This is something that I copied from a colleague, a friend. Uh, he's a Mexican. He has, he has been studying this disease for longer than I have. And he, they, he, he made this image that I found that is very um, useful. So you have on your left um, part of the screen, like before we have the disease. In this case, for the humans, it would be COVID, that we all know what COVID was. And on the right, we have the one of the most beautiful coral species that is called pearl coral in the Caribbean. So before the disease, the populations were fine, everyone was healthy, everyone was kind of thriving. But then we have what we know and we call endemic phase of the disease, and what that means is like we are now with COVID at this moment. The disease is still there, COVID is there, but uh, we don't have as many people getting sick or we don't hear about how many people died for it. So we are in that phase that the disease is over there, but it's not, it's not a pandemic anymore. So what I want you to pay attention is really on the color. So in the, in the left, again, human population in, in purple, what we see here is the population of humans that got the disease but didn't die. They just got sick and that was it. The black human that is on your um, left up corner is the one that they never got infected with the disease. And then you have on your, uh, on the lower um, row on the, on, the on the right, you have one with the, the um, a red belt. So that red belt indicates how many people really died from the disease. On the on your right uh, the screen, you have the corals, and in red you have all the 
corals, the population that actually died from the stony coral tissue loss disease. In purple is the one that still are getting some infected, but they haven't died. And in black is the one that hasn't died. So if we compare these two, like the stony coral tissue loss disease is killing more corals than what the COVID did. And this is like, of course, it's not like in numbers, it's more to show like how the populations were affected. So when we have the disease, one of the characteristics of it is that, and this is the only disease that actually has this, is has many coral lesions, many disease lesions. So you can see on the on the row, uh, on the upper row, you can see these brain coral. Those two are brain corals. The, the one on the top is the symmetrical brain coral, and the one on the bottom is a group brain coral. But as you can see in the symmetrical brain coral, you have two lesions, and this is between a month, and it's to show you how fast the disease kills corals. So you have all the white areas, that is dead coral tissue. So they're dead. In that area, there is no living tissue, only the areas that have like mustard, orangey color, those are what is living tissue. But because we do have the disease in these corals, they are getting infected and they can die in the next two weeks after the photos, the last photos was taken in day 31. And this is to show you like kind of in a bigger picture how it actually changes in terms of the, the ecosystem. So these photos, these are what we call photo mosaics. These are images that are from a large area um, in Grand Bahama, in a shallow reef in Grand Bahama, here in the Bahamas. And what you can see in your in the photo on your left that says March 2020 is all the red ones that you can, all the red like areas that you can see in the image, those are brain corals that were alive at that time. We went back to the same area and we took a picture, again, a lot of pictures to get this, this image. And you can see the few brain corals that are alive after about a year. And in even some of them, if you can see here, this one has a stony coral tissue loss disease. So this one is probably right now dead. So the number of colonies that we have in this area, we had in this area that we monitor every, every year, every two years, went from more than 500 corals, brain corals, to around 10 brain corals. That's it. So the mortality rate of the disease and the effect of the disease in coral reefs, it's very worrisome for many of the researchers and managers, because we know that if we lose coral reefs, we're going to lose all the benefits, and this will have many consequences on, on human communities that depend on these ecosystems. So what can we do about it? Many, many things. First of all, of course, we can uh, make more communication and education like this webinar just to talk about the stony coral tissue loss disease. This is a very general overview of this disease, but of course, if you get more involved, if you like to go in the water, swim, snorkel, and dive, it's always a good way to just to learn about it, how we can contribute and disinfect our gear. There are many different steps that we can that we can do. Um, we can beg, get involved, and this is what we do in terms of researchers, is we do assess we want to know how spread is the disease in the places that we work, how it's affecting coral population, how this is going to affect coral reefs, and how losing coral reefs is going to affect all the local communities and the tourists that live and depend on these ecosystems. The other thing that we do is actually there is a way to treat corals is, again, we don't heal them. We can treat them with antibiotic, actually with amoxicillin, and the disease stops. But it doesn't kill the corals, it just stops the disease. But because the pathogen is waterborne, the coral that we treat can get reinfected. So we have to visit all the different places over and over again to treat and sometimes retreat corals that are getting the disease. 
Uh, we are working to develop more new treatments. Uh, now we're trying with probiotics with different researchers in the US. And one of the things is because this is treating corals manually, we can treat so many corals. We cannot treat every coral in the reef. So we can save just um, a handful number of coral colonies. The other thing that we can do is, and many countries are doing this more and more, the US of course is the country with the highest number of land rescue facilities. So we take corals out of the water, out of the reef, and we put them in land facilities and we keep them there. And we try to propagate them. That is like kind of cutting in them in small pieces, reproducing them and getting more corals. So we can in the future do coral restoration and get the coral reefs to why they were before the disease at least. And of course, um, you can always learn more about corals and coral reefs, the importance and to understand more what is the threat of these new diseases, tonic coral tissue disease. If you're a diver snorkeling and you go to a place and you see something, look for the local NGOs that are managing the disease, report your sighting, take a photo if you can, send all the information and support of all your local NGOs. And I know this was fast, too many things, too many information, but again, thank you and hope that you have understand and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed learning from you. You do really fascinating work and I really appreciate you sharing your expertise. Uh, as you mentioned, we're going to transition into our uh, question and answer session for today's presentation. Our first question comes from Zoe, who's really wondering if stony coral tissue loss disease is being exacerbated by climate change. Um, we don't we don't know. That is the truth. We have so many questions about, about the disease, but the truth is that we don't think so. And I'm going to explain a little why. So many coral diseases, actually, we know that they that they have some relation with with temperature changes. So like bleaching, that is coral bleaching is, I think that most of the people have heard of them. And we know that the, when temperatures goes, go, go up, the coral just kind of bleach. So they expel the symbiont algae that lives in them. Uh, and, but the, if the temperatures goes down, the coral will be able to take the, the algae and they will be fine. And many diseases, when we have changes in temperature, they can either stop, um, you will have like seasons for diseases. With this one, very weirdly, it doesn't. Like you, it doesn't change the, the, the infection rate with temperature. So we don't think that it was. We do think that, we do think that the pathogen was somewhere in the, in the earth and just came to, to the, uh, to the um, to the sea environment and something and that probably is more than climate change just like eutrophication and all the nutrients coming into the water the pollution can, could be related to that. Thank you. Uh, Kate wonders if reef fish or other marine life can spread stony coral disease. Yes. So. We, there are a couple of animals that are more likely to spread it. So um, butterfly fish, it's one of the fish that we think it's spreading because what they do is, I don't know if you know them, but they have like really like a tube of their mouth and they go there and they kind of suck the, the polyps. They really like corals. Corals are not tasty. They just have a really thin, uh, tissue layer on top of the exoskeleton that is nothing else but calcium carbonate that is like sand. But what they, these fish do is they just like kind of suck the, the polyps and they go, they really like, and you see them when you have the disease crawl, they love, they have that. So the disease sometimes you can see is sluggish tissue from the colony. So they, you will see them just feeding from this tissue and they will go to a healthy coral and start feeding them. So we think that that one is a, a, a possible vector. The other one, it's uh, the fireworm. They can be as well because they really, they do like, so any animal that is actually 
feeding on corals could be a vector. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Tori's really curious. Is there anything that ships can do to prevent spreading the disease? Yes. So for big ships like cargo ships, what so we do have uh, an international agreement that is if you are like in a big ship, you and this is called ballast water, the water that they take in um, and, and discharge when they're coming to port. This ballast water, they should just discharge in 200 nautical miles from coast. Don't ask me how many miles are those, uh, but they're far. It's really, really far away. And one of the things we'd see is we have a lot of this, like the dispersion rate is really high. So if you put like a small microbe in the middle of the open ocean, it's very difficult for it to go into the coast. So that's why we have those. So if they follow that, that is perfect. There are other places that they have like ballast water treatment plants. So if you have that in port, that would be great because then they disinfect it. For small ships, there are a couple of recommendations. Just like kind of have like one cup, like some bleach in on the on board. And when you are just going from one place to the other, just add some bleach to that uh, bilge water that is called, and then you can just clean that water and again, put it in, in the water. I know that bleach into the sea doesn't sound good, but if you have like really small concentrations, it won't do anything really because of the dispersion rate. Thank you. Stephanie wants to know, do we know if this disease or similar diseases have affected coral species going back in the geologic record? No, we have no idea. One of the things with the uh, with the fossils is that they cannot give us any clue of the microbes or the the the, the cause of death. So we we sadly we don't, but we don't think we don't think we don't think that there were many coral diseases. It's just because coral diseases are relatively they're always been there we have always had all diseases but not as many as we have now so we don't think so but the truth is no we don't know sure sure gabby's hoping you could tell us a little bit more about the use of probiotics okay so the probiotics has the same principle that you have heard when you are looking at commercials and things is that they what they do is that they amplify like the, like the good bacteria, right? The good microorganisms. And what it does, it just has an effect on your immune system. So it helps you be more resistant and more healthy. So the probiotics for corals, uh, what the scientists do, and I'm not a probiotic scientist, I just work with a, with a couple of them, uh, what they do is they take samples from different healthy corals and they look how is all the bacterial community and they just try to see which of those components can have um, an effect on coral resistance. And they try different ones. So there is, this is like kind of something that you take and you, you do a lot of trials. And from there, they can learn like which are the best ones. And then we, we put them and they have done it already, like tried them in disease corals and actually help them for the disease either to stop as it does with the antibiotic, but as well, it kind of just goes really slowly and it helps the coral as well for reproducing more in terms of gametes or that they can produce. So it has a lot of good benefits for the corals. Sure, thank you. Um, so Zoe's wondering if you have any pictures or photos that you could show the visuals between the color stripping that's being done by coral bleaching and SCTLD. I do. <laughs> I do. I do. I just have to look for them. Um, but I, I do. So I, I can talk while I'm while I'm. I can answer more questions while I'm looking for some of them, but we do, I do have them. I just have to look for them. Sure. <laughs> um, David asks, where are the land-based biobanks in the Bahamas? 
Uh, so in the Bahamas right now, we are working with um, the government with the support of Atlantis and Disney, and we are setting up that um, land-based secure, biosecure, but it's still like kind of, it's, it's, it's in their beginning. So we don't have really anything right now that we can show, uh, but as soon as the government, it's going to be the one doing all the announcements. So we will have, we will, we will get it, but it's going to take a little, this year at least. Sure, sure. Um, Katie's wondering if there may be impacts of antibiotic use on the coral hosts and their zooanthellates um, or any other reef organisms. Uh, that is a really good question. Uh, we, there, and not me again, like I work with, uh, um, I collaborate with a bunch of, with many, many scientists, but the truth is that I, I'm not doing this, but there have been a couple of studies because that's one, one of the things that everyone is saying, like, kind of, okay, so we are taking antibiotics and putting, and we know that, we know that is not good. So the, the answer, the quick answer is like, we know that we're not causing major disruptions because the um, the concentrations of antibiotics is very small. And the way that we apply them, we mix it with a, with a paste that is called base to be. And that pace, what it does is the same as when we're having antibiotics, that the release of the antibiotic is really uh, slow. And the other thing is the amoxicillin with the light starts to degrade. So it doesn't stay in the water for that long. However, uh, that's why we want to change to other methods. We don't want to keep applying antibiotics because we do know that in the long term that could be. But with the, with their, their studies as well showing that the concentrations that we're using are so low to com comparing to the antibiotics that are coming into the sea from us just by flushing our waters, our toilets. And sort of a follow-up question on that one. Do you think that SCTLD may eventually develop immunity to this antibiotic or that antibiotics may also kill beneficial bacteria in the microbiome? Mm. Yes, of course it will. It will kill it will so okay, so where we apply the antibiotic is we do it right in the border of the disease. Uh, but it does everything that is um touched by this paste and the antibiotic will die. So that includes that includes everything. Uh, so as I'm telling you, there is the symbiotic uh, algae, all the bacteria, even good, but yes, it will kill everything. Okay, thank you. Um, Gabby asks if there have been any observations of coral colonies becoming or just being resistant to SCTLD. Yes, we have, but um, I have to say that we have to be careful, of course, every time that we go to a reef that has been having the disease for three, four years, that is what we call that the that the disease is endemic in their area. So it has been really for a long time and it has killed most of the corals that it can kill and you have some survivors. So we, we are assuming that those are resistant but the truth is that the persistence of this disease is very high as well. And I've been in reefs, I've been working in reefs for now more than three years. And I go to a place and I always have these coral colonies. I look like, yeah, you're doing great. You are resistant. And then I go the following month and the disease is starting. So we do, and we do believe that there are resistant corals. I think that we just have to be careful when we are looking for that resistant coral colonies. Sure, sure. Um, Alex referenced the recent study by Lauren Howe Kerr et al. at Rice University that shows evidence for a viral cause for SCTLD and is wondering why infected communities may be responding to antibiotic treatment if there is a viral cause. Okay, so. From that study, what, what they found is, yes, there is a virus in, involved, uh, 
but the virus affects the zoosentery, the symbiotic algae. So it seems that when it's killing the algae, it creates the, or opens a window for a secondary infection. And that is when bacteria starts to develop. And that's why antibiotic, again, like works because we do know that antibiotics is not for virus. So we do think that are really just like kind of some secondary infections and that's why the coral don't die. And the other evidence that is more like from observation, we're still doing some, some research is in corals that they have bleach because we had some bleaching event last year, especially here in the North Caribbean. Uh, from that bleaching event, most of the corals that were bleached, they didn't get stony coral tissue loss disease. So it is more likely that the virus is affecting the symbiont and then when they're bleached, they, they cannot start the disease. Great, uh, we have time for just a few more questions. Our next one is Fatima, who wonders if stony corals are the only ones showing disease or if there are similar diseases present in other corals. Um, can you repeat that? I Yeah, absolutely. I apologize. The question is, um, are stony corals the only ones showing the disease, or are there similar diseases present in other corals? Uh, no, stony corals are the only ones, so hard corals are the only ones affected by stony coral tissue loss disease. And I didn't show you, but uh, the disease doesn't affect, I told you, but it doesn't affect every single coral species. So the staghorn and elkhorn that are branching corals or the finger corals, they don't get the disease. They don't, don't get affected by it, but it's only stony corals. None of the soft corals get the disease or any other animals that we know. Thank you. Uh, Jonas asks if coral density decreases in certain areas due to the disease. Does the disease disappear in following years or is it dependent on high coral densities? So far, so far uh, in the areas that I've been and the uh, places that some of my colleagues are, we do know that when we have more corals, uh, so the, the disease has every peak, like every disease, right? So it starts just like kind of slow and then just affects as many as possible, especially the ones that are more susceptible, and then it starts going down, but it keeps infecting corals. So I do think that it's related with high densities, especially if you have the highly susceptible species. Uh, but if we do find even the disease in areas when you have like just very dispersed coral colonies, you, you still have it. So. Uh, we haven't found the relationship with density, but I think that is more related with the peak of the disease in terms of density and disease. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll wrap up with one more question. Our last one is gonna be from Sarah, who's wondering, how frequently are you in the field? And what are the next steps for your, as far as your work goes and for your team? Um. I go to the field as much as I can. Sometimes is every week, sometimes is every other week. We depend on, on things, depends on weather. So weather is a big factor. So we do assessments, but we try to do as much treatments as we can. Uh, and treatment is very tricky when you have surge or waves, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't stay, like it doesn't hold. So, if I go to the to the water and then I don't like the research, I won't be able to do any treatments. So I depend on weather. And of course I do more than just this. So it depends as well of other commitments like giving a webinar for like I'm doing now or having yeah, meetings. So it depends, but I try to go as much as possible. So actually I'm going on Friday with my team, and we do gonna be for five days in Abaco in a reef that is very to in our hearts. That is called Sandy Key because it's very nice, has a lot of corals and animals, fish, everything. Uh, but it, the disease is there, and we're gonna have all our teams going to be hands on deck, 
treating as many polls as we can. And the future with my team is we want to keep treating, uh, but we want to start as well if the government give us the permits to do some pilots on coral restoration uh, so we can do more and not only treat, but as well like restoring reefs. And I also pictures, I couldn't find them, but I can I can always send them and we can post them in the Anjari webpage uh, comparing like bleaching with the disease. So you have more clues on identification and I'm sorry about it. I didn't have them on hand. No problem. Thank you so much for doing that. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak from you to you and learn from you. So thank you so much for your time this morning. I know that we really appreciate you joining us. Um, it really means a lot. Well, At this thank you for the invitation again. Oh, my pleasure. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie to wrap up today's event. You're muted, Stephanie. Ah, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being with us here today. And thank you very much, Dr. Pizarro, for taking the time to share your work, your timely work and important work on coral reefs with us today. Uh, if you'd like to take a look at the K-12 extension resources that we've put together on this topic, they've been made available along with this recording um, at UF Earth Systems YouTube channel. And please take a moment to complete the survey link that you can find in the chat box and here on your screen. We'd love to hear from you. For more information about the Scientist in Every Florida School Program and the Anjari Foundation, you can visit our websites as well as follow us on social media. And finally, we have one more Ocean Expert Exchange event coming up, there it is, uh, in our spring semester lineup. On May 3rd, we'll be joined by Dr. Esther Guzman of Harbor Branch Oceanic Institute at the Florida Atlantic University. And she's going to be talking with us about her work seeking natural marine products um, that can potentially help us fight cancer. So we'd like to thank you for joining us today and we hope that you will have a wonderful rest of your day and look forward to